She has spent her literary life with ghosts, witches, and vampires, but now she claims to be leaving them all behind. Hi, I'm Ernie Manus, coming up on Interviews, our conversation with novelist Anne Rice. Where did all of this come from? Oh, who knows? I have no idea. When you decided to write about vampires, there were so many other things already written. There was a whole bunch of ideas, thoughts, things that these things yes, could yes. do and couldn't do. Yet you decided to go your own way. Did you ever have to be responsible to old myth? No, I don't think I ever did. Um, you know, I was, I was very much of a student at that time. I had finished my MA in English and I lived in Berkeley and I did a lot of research at the Berkeley UC Library. And I did at one point go and just check out other vampire fiction, just the way I'd always done academically, checked out what other people had written on a subject if I was going to do a paper on it, you Mm -hmm. know, to see what had been done. Um, And I discovered what had been done, and I thought, okay, nobody's doing what I'm doing. Nobody's doing the first-person voice of the vampire the way I'm doing it. Fine. The feel's clear. That's all I thought. And I guess what I used was... What I used were elements of the myth that had come to me really through Hollywood more than anything else. I had never really read Dracula by Bram Stoker. I think I had read Sheridan Le Fanu's story, Carmilla, somewhere in my mm-hmm. childhood. And he, he wrote that in the 1800s, and it's a very famous sensuous story with a female vampire. I think I had run across that somewhere. But I, didn't, I really don't remember it consciously. But what I was going with was what I had seen as a little girl in the black and white horror movies, the idea that the vampire couldn't exist in the light of day, the idea that, that vampires were aristocratic and highly sensitive and conscience-stricken, all of that really came from Hollywood. It was sort of a Hollywood myth that I'd imbibed. And I changed anything I wanted to change. You know, right away I decided that my vampires weren't going to be susceptible to garlic or crosses or things of this kind, that they were going to be adrift in a world, not knowing whether there was a God any more than we knew whether there was a God. They were earthbound, in other words. They hadn't crossed the divide into... Um, the great knowing or unknowing or whatever, you know, that they they were existential creatures just like we were. And it was all instinctive on my part. I didn't think too much about it, really. You know, I didn't sit there consciously thinking. I was just sort of doing it. How much of it changed as you wrote the future books? Um, Well, there was a lot of evolution. In the first book, I didn't deal with the ultimate powers that they could attain, I didn't deal with what happened to them over time in terms of strength. I, in the Vampire Lestat, in the Queen of the Damned, that's where I worked out a much larger cosmology right. about how, what happened to the very ancient ones, how long they could survive, how they got stronger and stronger, how they got whiter and whiter, and their bodies became less and less human, and then they could finally defy gravity. They could move through the air. Their telepathic powers became a burden to them because they could hear people's thoughts too much. All of that, you know, and and how uh, they were descended from one pair of vampires and finally, really, truly, from one vampire only. You know, I worked all that out. I wanted to have a great cosmology. That idea really enchanted me, the idea of working out a myth to back up what I'd started. You know, in an interview with the vampire, I just had the characters... And I sort of put them into space, but I didn't really know where they had come from. And I thought, well, okay, you know, this had to start somewhere, and, and now you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to say where it started. Did you ever find you'd written yourself into a corner? Um, a, there were times when I was unhappy with what I'd done, but, I had, but it was a challenge. I had to go on. For example, uh, I killed off a character that just couldn't die at one point. So I had to figure a way to... Save him. That was Armand. Mm -hmm. He died at the end of Memnock the Devil. He exposed himself to the sun. Well, that just didn't work. 
<clears throat> I mean, Armand didn't die. So I had to figure a way that Armand was saved, and I did, and I wrote the book, The Vampire Armand. Do the characters live for you in your mind? Oh, Are very they? much. Oh, yeah. very much. Especially the vampire Lestat. That's the main one that lives for me in my mind. I mean, Lestat goes everywhere with me. You know, if we walk into a department store, if I walk into a department store and I'm dazzled by, you know, modern styles and, and textures and, and uh, atmosphere, I, it's Lestat who's seeing all that with me. You know, yeah. the 18th century man of reason is looking at all this and, and, and just being stoned on it, you know. <laughs> and so I feel that too. Why do you think you have that sensibility? Well, I really don't know. Um, but I think a lot of it has to do with growing up in a very strange corner of the country, you know, in New Orleans. I was born in 1941, and so I really saw the old world uh, of the 40s. I remember pre-television. I remember radio days. I remember the Iceman coming up the back steps. Mm -hmm. I remember the first electric refrigerator in our house. You know, the big change when the Iceman didn't come any longer. I remember when the garbage trucks in New Orleans were pulled by mules and just heaped with open garbage. I remember that whole world. I was born at a unique moment to see the last of of a lot of things. My grandmother did laundry by hand in tubs in the kitchen. So I saw all of that. And then I was catapulted into the world of television and modern America when my family moved to Richardson, Texas. It was like we had stepped into a sitcom or something. The word sitcom didn't exist then, I don't think. But it was like we had stepped into Father Knows Best. Yeah. You know, it was, it was like we had moved through the television screen. By the way, we didn't even have a television until I was 12. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so, I mean, I, and I lived in what would be called a Catholic ghetto. Uh, we went to Mass and Communion every morning before class. The modern world was condemned, officially condemned by the Catholic Church. You know, the modern world was bad. So yeah. coming from that environment, then, and, and yet being an American, and then moving to Texas and moving to a, what I would call a white bread vanilla suburb, you know, uh, I really saw the world as an outsider might see it, as, as somebody from another planet in some ways. I mean, planet New Orleans. I mean, it was really planet Irish Channel in New Orleans. It, it was very strange. Yeah. And... Um, I never, of course, forgot my New Orleans roots, uh, the beautiful Garden District I used to pass through to go to school, the Irish Channel where the Irish had lived and worked, and the beautiful churches mm -hmm. of my parish where I still go to church to this day. Um, all of that stayed with me. But in modern America, I was sort of an outsider. I was sort of an outcast. I got along fine with people, you know, no question about that. But, but I saw everything in a different way. Yeah. You know, I, and, and when I was a, a little girl, I was very much wrapped up in the lives of the saints and in church history. And so I was sort of in a timeless uh, world, you know, uh, or, or a historical world. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't into the modern world. And so the modern world kind of took me by storm, especially when I went to college. Yeah, why? Um, because I left the Catholic community for good when I went to college. I went to a a secular college. I couldn't afford to go to a Catholic college. And there I really lost my faith. I, I wanted to read Kierkegaard and Sartre and be an existentialist and, and smoke camel cigarettes and, you know, <laughs> be dangerous. And, uh, <laughs> and I lost my faith. I just, I lost it. Um, it was a crisis of belief, really. Um, I saw the big wide world and all these books that I wanted to read and I was surrounded by wonderful people who weren't Catholics. And I just... My faith cracked, and for 30 years, really, I was an atheist. What brought you back? Um, it was faith again. I had the faith in 1998 to go back, but I had moved back to New Orleans by that time, and I had seen many people who had faith, and I was very moved by their faith. And I had tried to go back at other times, though. I mean, it was something that was nagging at me. But the faith came back to me, and I wanted very much to rejoin the community. I wanted to go to communion. And it was really a very, very basic faith in, in Christ. Yeah. You know, wanting to return to the altar, wanting to return to communion. The rest, you know, I was going to handle somehow or other. People on the outside would think, then, how can you write the books you write, dealing mm -hmm. with what you deal with, and then have a spiritual, religious 
basis, and how do you how do you merge the two thoughts? Um, well, my books are really pervaded with Catholicism and spirituality. Right. They really are. I mean, they're filled with imagery that comes from my being a Catholic, and they're a lot about questing. <clears throat> I mean, even an interview with the vampire, which was written probably in my darkest atheistic years, is all about Louis the vampire trying to search for some meaning, trying to find out if the vampires really serve the devil or are they part of God's plan? Is there any way that he can have any redemption? And so I think that reflected the way I felt at the time. And in, in recent weeks, I've been on a, you know, a book tour. I've been going all over the country, and I've discovered that the readership is very, very aware of all that in my books. People have been coming up and talking about that. Now, they all, there always were some people who did, but now there are a lot of people who do. Yeah. And they're talking about what they call the theology or the spirituality or the deeper meanings. And it's thrilling me to the core. You know, a book I wrote um, six or seven years ago, Memnock the Devil, where Lestat, my vampire hero, goes to heaven and hell. People are coming up with the signings with that book. They want that as well as Blood Canticle, the new book. And apparently that book now has like a cult readership. And I'm just thrilled because at the time when I wrote it, people sort of said, this is not a vampire novel. You know, why did he have to go to heaven and hell? Where are the vampires? Yeah. We want, you know, and there were, in fact, I wrote about this in Blood Canicle. I had Lestat talk about this, that people complained about his adventure. But um, I don't know. I, I mean, I think my works have always been connected with, with being Catholic. Even my most transgressive works have been connected in some way. Yeah. Now, my erotica, that's outside the pale, obviously, yeah. you know, um, of Christianity as we now know it, you know. And why do you say it like that? Because I, I don't, well, I don't want to sell my erotica and I don't want to push my erotica. It's something I wanted to do and I did it. But I, I have a deeper thought here, really. My erotica is playful. You know, it'll take care of itself. But the deeper thought that I really wanted to make was that I do think Christianity is evolving at this point, and it will reach a point where it embraces um, what we think of as more modern sexual ideals. Modern is a bad word, perhaps. More liberal sexual ideals. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the scientific discoveries of the last century have to have some impact on Christianity. And it has to, op the church has to open its doors, and by the church I mean all churches, have to open their doors to the gay community and to people with more diverse lifestyles. They've certainly already done it where the question of divorce is concerned. Mm -hmm. You know, divorced people are now embraced. Divorced and remarried people are embraced by all churches, pretty much. Um, even the Catholic Church, though it's called annulment. You know, it's, it's a little different, but... You know, that's changed radically in the last 50 years. And I think we're, we're going to realize that there are many, many, many gay people who want to be counted as God's children, and they want to worship with us. And uh, the Episcopalian Church has obviously gone through this and, and just had an Anglican, I mean, a, a, a gay bishop, you know, mm -hmm. consecrated. And I think we Catholics are going to see this change too, and it's going to be a cataclysmic change. Does it have to come from the people up, or does it have to come from the hierarchy down? How do the hierarchy is going to have to recognize what the, what the people are saying. It's yeah. going to be both, you know. It's going to come from the people through, and, and then the hierarchy is going to recognize it. When we talk about the people, and we talk about the public and changes in public opinion and the things they see, do you ever sit back and look in amazement at what an impact your writing has had on the community? I don't know what my impact has been. You know, I really don't. I just know what my readers tell me as they come up and talk to me at the signings. They send me emails. They write me letters. I don't know overall what the impact has been. Yeah. I don't really know. Um, I hope my books have inspired people on different levels. I really do because I certainly mean them to be more than entertainment. I mean them to be entertaining without doubt. And I don't for a moment... Um, I don't for a moment uh, object to being called a popular writer. I want to be a popular writer. But I certainly want more. I've always wanted more. I have the highest ambitions. Yeah. You know. Have you achieved what you wanted to achieve? Is there more to go for? Oh, I want to, I want to go for a great deal more. But I feel very happy about what I, what I think I've done so far. I mean, um, 
I'm glad, I think Blood Canticle is the last of the Vampire Chronicles. You say, I think. Well, sure. I want it to be the last. I really do. I want to be able to look back on the Chronicles. I want to see them as complete. I feel that everything that was promised in the beginning has now been done. All the major characters that were introduced in the Vampire Lestat, they've all told their tales in various books. They're out there. They're, it's all done, you know. And I want to look back on it. But I hate to leave Lestat, that character. I hate to leave his voice. And I also hate to leave Blackwood Farm, this place I created in the novel Blackwood Farm. Right. It's like a refuge for me. And it's a place where I can write about the South. And I, I love doing that. And so there's a little bit of conflict to me. And also, of course, I've been going to signings where literally hundreds of people have been coming up and saying, don't stop writing about them. <laughs> so it's, it's beginning to seem like a ridiculous decision to make, you know, <laughs> when people are just offering you book after book to sign, you know, to say, I'm yeah. not going to write this anymore. It seems crazy. But I do want to go on to something very different. What would the something very different be? I can't describe it yet, but I have a very special book that I want to finish up that's at home that's quite different, and then I want to do a new supernatural series of books that do not involve vampires or witches, but they do involve the supernatural. Wow. Okay. And my brain is just popping, like yeah. it's popcorn popper in the neighborhood show. When you want to write, do you sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write now, or do you have to wait for the story to come to you somewhere? I frequently force it. I frequently go and say, this is, I'm going to write. Yeah? Yeah, it's a discipline. My husband and I both did that. He was always very much for that kind of thing. You know, go in there and just make yourself start. Yeah. But you can always think of reasons not to write. I mean, there are, you know, a million. Yeah. You know, so you, you do have to go in there, I think, and sit down and see what happens, basically. Now, I know you've, you've spoken about it before, that your husband's passed on now. Yeah. Does that have anything to do with your decision to leave the supernatural for a while? No, I'm not leaving the supernatural. I'm ah. not leaving it in my books at all. Uh, but, no, his death did not have anything to do with it. It was something I decided, actually, before I even knew he was sick. Really? Mm -hmm. But he, but I did base the Vampire Lestat on Stan when when I wrote it in 1974. That was Stan, you know, six feet tall, blonde hair, blue eyes. It was an exact description of Stan, even to the feline grace and the decisiveness and the strength and everything. But no, uh, Lestat became a character in his own right, and he ceased to be Stan at some point. And as I said, the decision was made before. Yeah. Stan even knew he was sick. I do want to talk a little bit about the taking of your books to other mediums, film and now the stage. Are you comfortable with that or not? Well, it's, it's, I, I always have high hopes. You yeah. know, I'm really a film buff, and I dream of great films. And I think with Interview with the Vampire, that was a great film. I think David Geffen saw to it. Uh, that that was a great film. He brought together spectacular talent, and Tom Cruise wound up playing The Vampire Will Stop with great gusto and passion. Brad Pitt was terrific as Louis. Kirsten Dunst was great as Claudia. It was great. That film was great. Other ventures haven't been so successful by any stretch, and it's been exquisitely painful. I mean, it's been awful to watch, you know, the adaptations where they have just not been faithful and have pretty much wrecked the material. When you sell the rights, what kind of right do you hold on to, or does it all go? I don't have any. I mean, I never do. It's, um, but I think at this point, my relationship is pretty good with people who are working on my stuff right at the moment. Now, there's a musical in development now on Broadway, and um, Elton John and Bernie Taupin have written all the songs for it. They've sent me the music. I've listened to it. It's absolutely magnificent. It is wonderful. I mean, it's, it's just beautiful. It's going to be a fabulous music. And it's based on the first three books, correct? It is. It's How based can on that the... fit into one show? Oh, it's, well, it's mainly, the, it's mainly Interview with the Vampire and the Vampire Lestat. It's, that story. it's the story of Lestat and what happens to him. And that's what unites it. And they have Linda Wolverton writing the script, and she's very experienced on Broadway and has had great success. Rob Roth is the director, and of course Elton John's music and Bernie Taupin's lyrics. It's just a fabulous mix of ingredients, and it's already in some sort of production stage at this point. 
And I'll be going to New York shortly to listen to the first, what they call read-through of it, where they'll yeah. sing and so forth. And I'm tremendously excited about it. I've already heard the songs, as I've indicated, and they're just, they're just wonderful. It's going to be very rich, very dark, very lustrous. It captures the tragic feeling of the books perfectly. Yeah. It's just going to be beautiful. It's going to be something just uh, luminous and sensuous and transporting. I mean, when you sit down and you listen to those songs, it's like entering into a trance. Yeah, and then they're taking The Witching Hour, The Witch Books. And now, that's happening on television. The Witching Hour books, Witching Hour, Lasher, and Taltos, they're being adapted into a 10-hour series for NBC right now. Wow, wonderful. Yeah, that's very good. Now, I, I have a lot of input on that. I talk all the time with John Wilder, who is writing the screenplays, and he's done a wonderful job. And he's being very, very faithful to the characters. There's some adapting going on because it is network TV. You know, and John Wilder is just a master at all of this. I mean, he's done many, many long series for television. He goes way back. He worked with James Michener, and he knows really how to adapt books. That's what he does with just great finesse. He's done other things as well, but he's just a very faithful adapter. Yeah. It's just terrific. When you sit down to write... What challenges face you that you want to work through in your writing? The first thing I want, I guess, is an immediate voice. And I have to keep um, bringing that voice closer and closer uh, to the narrator himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the first challenges. Not to slip into a remoteness on the page. A formality, but to keep it fresh. Does that mean you have to write quicker too to keep it fresh? Or no. can you take your time on it? No, I can take my time, but I do write very fast actually, and I love to write fast, but I go over it and over and over it. You know, there's a lot of editing. I mean, the computer is a great tool for me because I do edit over and over and polish and work. I tend to do that chapter by chapter. You know, I work and work and work on chapter one until it's really perfect, and then I go to chapter really? two. Yeah, I don't work in drafts at all. I just, I accumulate that manuscript. By the time I get to the last page, it's finished. Why do you, you know? think that works for you? Well, I evolved that method many, many years ago because it was the only way I could survive in the mess of my own office and workspace, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I just, it was the only way, I did it page by page on the old typewriter. Only when the page was perfect did I go into the next page. And then I would get discouraged maybe and throw out a whole 30 pages and start over again. But when I got to the last page, it was a fair copy. You know, it was Having just a method. Having said all of that, are there unfinished drafts that exist of books for you or once pretty much you start a book that's going to go through too? I do have some fragments I do have some fragments um, and sometimes I go back to them and look at them and try to use the material um, I do have some floating pieces but not too many not, not too many um, when I start work on something I pretty much finish it yeah. it's one reason I really don't like to work in TV and in the movies too much um, you know, I like to be totally in charge of what I'm doing, and when I do it, it gets done. You yeah. know, it's, it's such a despairing thing to go to work in those, in those areas where things don't get done. You work on a series, you work out all these ideas, and then you hear, no, we're not going to do it. You know, yeah. <laughs> I can't stand it. I mean, when I work on a book, it gets published. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and without being edited, as I understand, too. Right. Well, I do an enormous amount of self-editing and polishing, and those sentences are really the way I want them to be. You know, Authors differ on this. It's all individual. Some authors don't do that. They want the editor to come in and clean up the sentences. They want the editor to, to to edit down the manuscript. I really polish my work and have it just the way I want it, you know. Yeah. And all I really need is for my editor is just response, how she feels about the book. She's a fabulous mentor to me, and she guards me through all the stages of production. And I carry with me in my heart all the words she's ever said to me about my books. But no, I don't want anybody to come in and change anything. Yeah. You know, it's done. It's pretty much done. I'd have to have something catastrophically wrong with it, you know, pointed out to me before I'd change anything. Yeah. Advice you gave to your son when he said he wanted to be a writer? Oh, well, he was already a writer before I knew it. 
my husband came down with the manuscript in his hand and said, you know, he's, this is, his life is going to change. And he had the manuscript of A Density of Souls, Christopher's first novel, and I hardly even knew what was happening. I had been in the hospital. <laughs> I'd nearly died from a diabetic coma, and Christopher had gone into his room and written this novel. So I didn't have any chance to give him any advice. He was already a novelist. My husband was suddenly on the phone to New York calling our agent saying, this is, this is fantastic, you have to read it. And I didn't even read the manuscript. I was so sick with diabetes and recovering from this coma, Christopher had an agent and an editor before I even read the manuscript. <laughs> so I didn't have a chance to give him any advice. So he was in the big time. Before would, you, I, would you have any advice for him now? Oh, well, now we talk all the time. Yeah. You know, we email each other back and forth, and I just... I just tell him to go for it. You know, we, we discuss our work a little bit, not very much. I know he's working on his third novel right now, and my advice is just write, and that's what he tells me, too. I get yeah. stuck, you know, and we just, we just encourage each other. It's really great. He tells me what he's reading, you know. He recently sent me an email and told me he was reading Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep, and I said, I have a funny story to tell you about it when you're finished. Let me know, you know. <laughs> And uh, we, we just email back and forth like that. You know. Well, unfortunately, as always, we run out of time. I want to thank you so much, Anne Rice, for sitting down, chatting with us. Oh, I enjoyed it. And truly a pleasure to meet you. Well, it was a pleasure to meet you, too, and thank you. Thank you. Anne Rice. To order a transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send $6.95 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest. 